Good afternoon. Since she spoke English, I will skip my finish and go straight to English, not wanting to be misunderstood. Um, well, thank you, Johanna and Timo, for bringing me here. And I know there are other sponsors in the audience and folks who helped out. I've never been to Finland before. I've spent a, f a lot of time in Europe. I lived in Italy for a couple of years. Um, I've worked in Norway. I've been to Sweden. Skipped Denmark. Who needs to see Denmark? <laughs> um, of course, Denmark is known as being the most bikeable place in the, in the world. Well, maybe. Copenhagen is. Um, so I need to go there at some point. But I figure I'm just on my way to St. Petersburg. We'll get there eventually. Um, but thank you for having me here. And it's, it's, a real, it's an honor for me to address you. And it's a, it's a privilege for me to um, actually come here and see a country which, as Johanna suggests, not incorrectly, um, has yet to make many of the mistakes that we have made in the U.S. and may not make those mistakes. But I, I do think, you know, I think the important, it's important to share that, that my practice is an, really an American-focused practice. And my writing and my book, Walkable City, was all about America and didn't concern itself with the issues in other countries. And in fact, we Americans look to Europe, as you're probably aware, we look to Europe we progressive Americans, you know, we Americans who are trying to provide best practices, best practices, we look to Europe for the models. But in fact, I even try not to do that because when you go to um, Indianapolis or you go to Oklahoma City and you show them something from, from Paris or Stockholm, it doesn't count at all. You show them something from New York City, it doesn't count. Right? New York City is so different from the rest of America. So it's been very important in my practice to focus on those places that are, that are believable, you know, that are similar to the places where I work. That said, I think there are a lot of issues that are relevant here, and even some things that might surprise you that you'll find useful in the work that we do in the US. So I went through all the things I like to talk about, which adds up to many, many hours, and I picked those Six hours, you all have six hours, right? <laughs> I, picked, I picked the, you know, 60 to not, maybe 90 minutes of stuff that I thought was probably relevant, and I'm gonna count on you to decide what's relevant and what isn't. And I'm sure something I'm gonna tell you is not relevant. Something else I'm gonna tell you is the wrong message, just the wrong thing for you to hear. Ignore that. Um, so I am counting on you a little bit to take my American message and make it relevant to you, but I think based on these guys deciding that it was worth bringing me here, that there must be some reason I'm here. So um, how, do I, uh, how do I start this on the screen? Do I push a button or does someone else uh, push a button? I'm pushing the show mode. Okay, excellent. So greetings from Boston, Massachusetts, where I live. Um, this is now my credibility that I can work in northern places, because you may know that we set a record this winter uh, in Boston for, um, for snowfall. Um, it's not all bad news. It can be a lot of fun. This is a talk, so the talk I'm gonna give you that is a talk we call The Walkable City, and there's actually several different talks I like to give. Um, a talk I give a lot is called Why We Need It, um, and then I spend a lot of time talking about how to do it. Today, we're gonna to focus on how to do it. Um, why we need it is a different talk, and I wanna spend just five minutes on it because it's, so, it's important not to forget. So I'm not gonna give you this talk today, but when my book came out about two years ago, I went around the country and probably in about 50 cities, gave a talk, actually without images, about why this was such an important discussion. And the story is, as a planner, having talked about urbanism for so many years um, and finding limited interest in the audience and limited uptake and, uh, and struggling, struggling to convince people about the importance of good planning, we realized that there were actually three different groups who were arguing for the same stuff, but they were groups that people listened to. 
You know, no one really listens to planners, sorry. No one really listens to planners. People listen to economists, and they listen to epidemiologists, you know, doctors, and they listen to environmentalists. And in the U.S., certainly not everyone listens to the environmentalists, but a lot of people do. Um, and these three groups, each independently, had been arguing for the same stuff that we were arguing for, which was essentially walkable, bikeable urban design. But they had a much more compelling message. The first message from the economists has become very clear that designing around the automobile is effectively bankrupting our country, our country being the U.S. You know, from 1970 until the present, we've doubled the number of roads in America. And what we've accomplished with that is we've doubled the amount of money that each of us is spending on transportation. So we used to spend one out of ten dollars on transportation, now we spend two out of ten dollars on transportation because of this obligation to own the vehicle. And working Americans, working class Americans, are spending as much on transportation as they are on housing, and poor Americans are spending 40 percent of their income on transportation because we've created this environment where uh, the, the automobile, the technical term is the automobile, has the automobile has become a prosthetic device. It's like the artificial limb that you cannot live your life without. And there's been a tremendous cost. On the other side of the coin, there's the experiment that we've had going in certain American cities, and if you look to Canada or look to Europe, you can find much better examples, but again, only American examples count in American cities. A city like P Portland, Oregon, I'll show you some images from Portland, Oregon, which is about the only American city that back in the 70s decided to grow in a different way. They decided to grow more like Vancouver. And instead of investing in highways, they invested in bikeways. Instead of growing and growing and growing, they put in an, an urban growth boundary. And they made just a whole bunch of decisions reorienting themselves around transit, biking, and walking. And what they found, actually, is that the amount of savings to the typical Portlander, just from those slight decisions, was about 3% of their income. So they were spending 10 minutes less a day, the average Portlander, 10 minutes less a day in traffic, and saving 3% of their income by having to drive less. And then you look at the life in Portland, which has become kind of famous as being a heaven of, of you know, cappuccino shops. But in fact, in Portland, people are spending more money on on books, they're spending more money on recreation, they're spending more money on um, their houses. And that's what happens when you don't have to drive so much. So we have these lessons in the U.S. of a national trend in which driving is bankrupting us, and then some examples of what happens in a community that, that decides. For example, in Portland, they went from biking. In Portland, they used to bike about the same amount as the rest of the country, and now they bike 15 times as much as the rest of the country, which is kind of similar probably to how much you bike here. But it's been dramatic, and the impact, the impact has been dramatic based on very limited investment. So the second issue, you know, so every, actually every city I work in wants this vitality, and so it's an easy sell. We're all scared to death of the health crisis in America, which is principally an obesity epidemic. And everyone talks about diet and the horrible American diet and all the bad foods we eat and the giant portions we eat. Who's, been, who's eaten in America? It's ridiculous, right? But the latest studies show actually that diet has much weaker a correlation to weight than inactivity. There's a doctor at the Mayo Clinic, James Levine, who put his patients in electronic underwear that measured their activity and he held all their diets steady and held their weights steady. And then they started pumping in the calories to see what would happen. And they found out that the principal determinant of how much weight the person gained, what they thought it would, would be metabolical, they thought it would be something in their, in their inheritance, right? But it turned out simply those who gained weight were sitting for two hours more per day than those who didn't. And in fact, that's a, a not unusual American commute, two hours a day, driving your car. And the studies are now very clear that we have these neighborhoods, these auto-based neighborhoods, these suburban sprawl neighborhoods, they call them obesogenic. 
which means if you live here, you will be unhealthy. And so that's a very important argument, ignoring the single greatest killer of young Americans, which is car crashes. And it's astounding because in New York City, they lose three people per 100,000 per year in car crashes. It's probably even lower here, but it's probably, it might be similar. In Orlando, they lose 15 per 100,000. Five times as many, based on the way the city is designed. Orlando, which is automotive, versus New York, which is pedestrian. And then there's other issues as well, having to do with, with um, asthma, which is focused principally in driving cities. So there's a tremendous health argument also. And there's an incredible book called Urban Sprawl and Public Health which is, offers compelling evidence why we need to be more walkable. And then finally, there's the environmentalists. And this is a movement that, at least in America, in America, the environmentalist movement has been anti-city from the start. Thomas Jefferson said, cities are pestilential to the health, to the liberties, to the morals of man. If we continue to pile upon ourselves in cities as they do in Europe, we shall become as corrupt as they are in Europe and start eating one another as they do there. So the history of the environmental movement in the U.S. has been anti-city, and that was only made stronger by the discussion of carbon. Because where, you know, where is there the most carbon? This is Chicago. If you measure carbon per square mile, then obviously cities are bad, suburbs are better, and the countryside is best. But then someone realized, well, you know, there are only so many of us in the country at any, at any given time, and we can live wherever we want. So shouldn't we live in the place where each household contributes the least carbon. So if you start measuring instead of carbon per square mile, carbon per household, right, carbon per person, the map completely changes. So this is carbon per square mile, this is carbon per household. And what it says is that the countryside is as dirty as can be, and the suburbs are a little better, and the inner city has, is where you have the lightest footprint. So the message is, if you're really interested in preserving the environment, the best thing you can do is move, move from the countryside to the suburbs or from the suburbs to the city. So these, these three messages together have really created this steamroller now where Americans understand there's a whole back to the city movement you're probably aware of, and it's not like everybody's talking about it, but we've finally found you know, the star which we can hitch our wagon to. And we don't call it urbanism anymore. We don't call it, you know, for a while we called it new urbanism. Before that we called it traditional town planning. Then we just called it best practices in urban design. We don't call it any of those things anymore. We call it walkability. Because no one's against it. Even the head of General Motors wants to be able to walk to the store. And so we finally found the way to communicate this message that I think, that I think is most effective in communicating the message. Um, but if you really want that talk, it's a TED talk. Has anyone seen this talk besides Johanna and Timo? So I'm not going to give you this talk today. I mean, I just did in five, in five minutes. But if you want to really have the compelling argument for why walkability, just go on TED and, and look me up. But that's not your talk today. Today we're going to do how to do it. And we begin with this premise that walkable places are thriving places, which you, you used to have to argue. Now it's no longer an argument. Everyone understands that walking places are thriving places. And you ask this question, if walkable places are thriving places, how do you get people to walk? And the answer is what I call the general theory of walkability. It's a little tongue in cheek, but it is a theory, which means it's a hypothesis which is constantly being tested and refined. And it's the backbone of, of my book. I will not be selling and signing books tonight, <laughs> but there it is. And what it says is, if you're going to get people to walk in a society in which driving is easy and cheap, and you pay about twice for gas what we pay, but you're still not paying the full cost of driving. So because your driving is subsidized, you're smart to do it as much as possible. Also, the vast majority of the costs of owning a car are owning the car, with only a minority of the cost being driving the car. There's a tremendous fixed cost and very limited marginal cost of use. So once you own the car, the smart thing is to use it all the time. And it sits in the driveway between you and everything. It's so easy to fall into it. 
So if we're going to get people to walk, then the walk has to be, it has to offer an experience that's as good as the drive or better than the drive. To do that, it has to do four things simultaneously. The walk has to be useful, the walk has to be safe, it has to be comfortable, and it has to be interesting. It's not a hierarchy. You have to do all these things. If you don't do them all, you will not create walkers by choice, and you won't have a walking society. So you can really, dis you can really split this discussion up into the larger scale and the smaller scale, the larger scale being planning, and my job, that's my job to discuss here. We talked about it, Joanna and I plotted, and I'm giving talks here, and then for many of you, I'm giving talks tomorrow in Helsinki. So planning is in Lati, and architecture is in Helsinki, which is funny. Is this, a, is this a Finnish band? It's an American band? Do you guys know this band? This is a famous band called Architecture in Helsinki. It's Australian. Oh, it's Australian, okay. So we're doing Architecture in Helsinki, and we're doing planning in Lati. Um, but basically, to be fair, because a lot of you won't be with me tomorrow, I'm going to do a little bit of the architecture as well, just so you don't miss the whole hierarchy. Because essentially, planning is the reason to walk and the safe walk. And architecture is, and urbanism, right, really the, the level of design, is the comfortable walk and the interesting walk. So I'm going to talk about all four of these tonight. But for those of you who can make it to Helsinki tomorrow, I'll be getting into much more detail on the comfortable walk and the interesting walk. So, the first question then about a walk being useful is, do you have a proper balance? Do you have a, do you have a, do you have a good balance of uses in your community? Because that's why we have a reason to walk. Now, this is the story then uh, these are my mentors, Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, and they founded the New Urbanism Movement uh, back in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what I'm telling you today I learned from them. Frankly, a lot of my slides I stole from them, with their blessing. And um, this is a story that Andres used to always tell called the, the Story of Planning. And it tells how in, you know, in Europe, in the, in the 19th century, people were choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills and it was the planners, who weren't then called planners, who said, let's separate the housing from the factories. And of course, lifespans increased dramatically and immediately. <coughs> Excuse me. And the planners were all hailed as heroes. And we like to say they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since. So you have the, you have the onset of what in the US has been legalized as Euclidean zoning the separation of the landscape into single areas, large areas of single use. And you should know, you know, even though we planners know that this is wrong now, um, most of the time when I arrive at a site to plan it, and that site has already been planned, there's a plan like this already sitting on the site that we have to get rid of. Because it was the standard for so long, in which, you know, in, in which factories are separated from shopping, but Shopping is separated from office, and office is separated from medical office, and high-density housing is separated from low-density housing to these minuscule segments of the landscape. Now, I was an art history major in school. They say that's not that valuable, but I can say you don't want a Rothko, you want a Seurat. Right? Seurat was the pointillist. And the most walkable places, of course, are the places that, that have this confetti of uses, the smallest areas. And then also, this is, this is misleading, this red color here is uses that are mixed vertically. So you don't even necessarily have use rules at all. But of course, you make sure that everything is allowed to mix with everything else, with the rare exception of those few industries that still pollute these days, which we like to say in the US, we've exported them all to Mexico and China. So, that leads to the fundamental new urbanist argument, which this may be the most important, like a lot of, a lot of the stuff I'm gonna tell you today about the details, you're, you already understand, but I think the biggest use I can be to you is to give you the fundamental new urbanist theory, which is that there are only two tested ways to build community throughout history and across cultures. There are a thousand ways to make a city, but there's only two that we've tested by the thousands. And one of them is the traditional neighborhood, 
and the other is suburban sprawl. And the traditional neighborhood is defined as being diverse, compact, and walkable. The diversity you can see in one, in one neighborhood, places to live, places to work, places to recreate, places to worship, places to go to school, places to shop, it's all there. Now, you may have to leave to go to the hospital, you may have to leave to go to college, you may have to leave to broaden your gene pool to, to find someone to mate with, right? But most of what you need is there. It's <clears throat> compact. This is actually several neighborhoods of Newburyport, Massachusetts, near where I grew up. It's compact throughout history, again, and across cultures. It's almost always a five-minute walk from the edge of the neighborhood to the center, which is about a quarter, 400 meters from the edge of the neighborhood to the center. And you find that everywhere. And then it's walkable because there's lots of streets, so no one street needs to be too big. Now, sprawl, in contrast, it's clearly not diverse. You know, whole square kilometers will have just one use, or in this case, just one house. Sometimes you turn it sideways, but it's just one house. It's clearly not compact, thus the name sprawl. And <clears throat> this is interesting, because so few of the streets actually get you anywhere, those, you know, the cul-de-sacs and the loops, those few streets that do connect become overburdened with traffic, and they become noxious. We call them traffic sewers. All they handle is cars, as many as possible. And see, these houses have turned their back to them. You get this phenomenon that we call the cul-de-sac kid, which is the child who's perfectly content until about age seven or eight, you know, with the bicycle in the cul-de-sac. But at a certain point, they want their independence, and they, you know, they say, you, know, you give them their allowance and say, spend it any way you want. And they say, great, can I have a ride to the shopping mall? Because they can't have independence in this system. So it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work. I mean, you have these too, but we have the best ones in America. <laughs> where you only shop. Schools get bigger and bigger and bigger. We were talking about this with the folks from the municipality today. The schools get bigger and bigger and bigger, which means they get further and further apart. Because the more kids you're serving, the greater your radius. And so this is your typical Florida school that no child has ever walked to, no child will ever walk to. Look at the size of the parking lot compared to the size of the school. So the seniors and the juniors are driving the freshmen and the sophomores with the death rates to prove it. And then sports facilities, supersized, consolidated. They're very proud here of their eight soccer fields and their eight baseball diamonds. But this kid needs his mom to drive him an, a, a mile, you know, to get to sports. And this is in the US, this idea, it's called the, so have you heard of the soccer mom? Who's driving the kids all day long? We invented the soccer mom when we invented this model. And what everyone forgot to count, you know, when Le Cabousier did the Plan Voisin, which was the, his great vision, and when Frank Lloyd Wright did Broadacre City, which was his great vision, both of the future of, of car-based living, they just forgot to count the cars. In fact, Frank Lloyd Wright had people floating around in little helicopters, remember? Little personal helicopters. If you separate everything from everything else and reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then your interstate system, which was created for commerce and for vacation travel, becomes a commuting system. And that's what we've burdened ourselves with in the US. So I tell people it's a two-part deal. For some people, it turns out a minority now, we've finally done the polling right. For a minority of people, this is the dream. But it's a two-part dream, <laughs> dream and nightmare because separation requires reconnection with highways. And the amount of money we spend, God forbid you have to wait two cycles at a light, right? If you have to wait two full cycles at a light in sprawl, your life is over, because it's so miserable. And so to avoid that impossibility, where the traffic planners give it an F, and tell you it's impossible. To avoid that possibility, we invest millions of dollars in our horizontal infrastructure, and we, we rob our vertical infrastructure. 
So our, city's hall, our city halls look like crap. Our schools look like crap. Our churches look horrible. But this is our gold-plated roadway. And the experience of being in these places can be very frustrating. This is not Photoshop. This is an actual intersection. Uh, being a driver can be no fun. Um, being a pedestrian can be worse when you design around the automobile. And then the epidemiologists who I mentioned, you know, this is the slide. I got this from a doctor. And he's been showing this at conferences for 15 years. You know, the idea that it's normal in America to drive to the parking lot, to park, to take the escalator to the gym, to get on the treadmill, to walk, is the reason why we have the first generation of American kids who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents. You know, I, I didn't mention one third of all American children born after 2000 are expected to be diabetic by the Center for Disease Control. But this is what we've done, and the doctors tell us, we have engineered out of existence the useful walk by the way that we now design our neighborhoods. So here are the two models, and as you grow your cities, as you grow Lati, as you grow Helsinki, you need to remember these models, because they're, it's the same stuff, right? This is the collector road with the big boxes and the large areas of single use, but you can recombine it into the network of a, of a town. It's the same stuff, but this is an entirely different healthy lifestyle than that lifestyle. <clears throat> so, when you're looking at an existing place, okay, so that, back up. That was the talk about making new places, which is over. We're gonna talk the rest of the time about your existing city centers, and particularly about Lati, because that's the, where we are. But when you're making, when you're trying to improve an existing place then, in this first category, the useful walk, you just ask this question. What is missing or underrepresented? And in most American cities, it's housing. I believe you're, what, we, what we call the jobs ha housing balance, I believe your jobs housing balance here is, is pretty good in downtown Lati and the areas where you can walk to downtown. So when you have it as good as it can be, then of course everything gets better. Jane Jacobs talking about Wall Street in the 1960s, <clears throat> Wall Street in New York, which was very different in the 1960s, said, of course there are no, good rest no great restaurants on Wall Street, of course there's no great gyms on Wall Street, because a great restaurant or a great gym needs daytime customers and nighttime customers. And Wall Street back then was just a working place and not a living place. Now it's m more balanced, and Lati is, is pretty balanced. But always think about becoming a complete district. Think about downtown, as being as complete as possible and getting the balance as even as you can and it will be most useful. There's a second question, which, which I was advised to discuss. Interesting question. In most cities, most cities, what is underpriced and because it's underpriced, therefore overrepresented and the answer is usually parking. People make choices again, just like they drive as much as they can when the driving is cheaper than it should be. The phenomenon in most cities, American, European, Asian, is that when we underprice parking, we tend to provide too much of it. So you guys are thinking a lot about parking. It's funny, because your, your PowerPoint is Finnish, so every English word is misspelled. <laughs> but you guys are doing a lot of thinking about parking. And it's clear, it looks like you're getting everything right. And I won't go through the details of your plan, which Johanna has presided over, but um, it looks like you're getting almost all of it right, and we'll talk about what might change. But <clears throat> being advanced, your planning department understands um, that parking should be distributed in zones which are priced based upon demand, because parking is a good that has value. If you do not price the good in relationship to its value, the market goes haywire. This is why the Soviet Union couldn't keep bread on the shelves, because they set an artificially low price for bread. This is what bread should cost. And then there was no bread, because there was no incentive to make it, because people were paying too little for it. And so parking behaves the same way. 
And the theory all comes from this fellow who's, whose name is Don Shoup, who's just retiring this week. <clears throat> He's the dean of American parking. Um, he wrote a book that's this big, three and a half pounds and 723 pages, called The High Cost of Free Parking, which nobody reads because it's too heavy. But he writes beautifully. I had jury duty, so I read it. And, um, <clears throat> but I turned it into a chapter in my book. And basically, what he has discovered, well, first of all, parking is the single greatest land use in most cities, certainly in most American cities. And what he's discovered is basically, we've been managing it for 100 years or so with the wrong objective. We asked the wrong question. The question was, how can we have enough parking? Right? That's always been the question. The right question should, was, the question should have been, how can we provide, build, and manage parking in a way that will cause our cities to thrive? And if you ask the question that way, based on experience and experiment, you get an entirely different set of answers, which lead to a th what he calls a three, well, I, think, I, I don't think he calls it this, but it's essentially a three-legged stool. Three different things you need to do. The first is to get rid of the on-site parking requirement. The on-site parking requirement, this was once an opera house in Detroit. The on-site parking requirement does a lot of bad things to cities. Most cities, American, European, you name it, do not have an on-site parking requirement for, for, in their downtowns, I should take it back, most large cities, the typical smaller American city has on-site parking requirements for absolutely everything. But our more walkable cities, our older cities, in our downtowns, we don't have on-site parking requirements, particularly for retail, because they stop good stuff from happening. Let's say you want to turn an empty furniture store into a music store. Well, it turns out a music store typically requires five times as much parking per square foot as a furniture store. And so the only way to transform it is to tear half the store down and put in more parking spaces, right? So it's an incredible impediment to growth. But it also just destroys our downtowns. And of course, parking people on site, well, in the US, it's typically meant in front of the building, so the sidewalk is ruined. But it also eliminates every reason to walk around, because if you can park in front of every single business that you're visiting, there's no reason to use the sidewalks at all. But his point is, do not remove parking from the downtown. Just don't require minimums, because first of all, developers will figure it out. Developers will figure out what their clients need. But secondly, as you're doing with your new central square, you want to provide parking not on site, but consolidated. So it becomes a pedestrian anchor in your downtown. It disgorges pedestrians, and it receives them, and it's something that people walk to and from. But it takes the pressure off each individual site and it creates walking. Um, his second point, which I already mentioned, is you need to price parking in relation to its demand. So here's probably, this is probably the first downtown parking plan in the US, not so different from what I showed you, which was the Lati plan of zones. And on the main street, where everyone wants to be, that's where it's most expensive, and it's a little less expensive further away, and then the further you get, the cheaper it is, and then, of course, the city lots, which you want people to park in first, are less expensive than the main street. <clears throat> this functions spatially. It also functions temporarily. There are certain times of day when prices need to be different than other times of day. And what most American cities have done, even if they've come this far, and not many have, is they still have this illusion that the clock stops at 7 p.m. or parking should be free on Sundays because it's in the Bible or something, that you can't pay for parking on Sunday. But you need to be honest and say, we're going to have market-based pricing or we're not. But if you're going to have market-based based pricing, then it, it's around the clock and you, you know, when people are showing up for restaurants, that's not when you make the parking free. Now, why does this work? This works because it creates availability. You want, your goal should be one empty space per block face at all times, so that the wealthy guy who wants to buy a fur for his wife can pull in to the fur shop. And the more someone's willing to spend, the less patient they are. And people park different distances, actually, based upon their capacity to spend, 
which is why, and this is the biggest struggle, this is why the parking meter was invented by businesses for businesses, to create that churn, to create that availability. And the businesses forget it and they fight you because they think that if you charge more for parking, no one will shop, which isn't true. But to convince them, to get them on your side, you probably need to do the third leg of Shoop's stool, which is called the Parking Benefits District. What the Parking Benefits District, this says, does is your meter money makes a difference in old Pasadena, safety, streets, cleanliness, alleys. Every extra dollar that they make by charging the right price for parking, they pour into the streets, the sidewalks, the trees, the storefronts. These are the rear alleys in Pasadena. They turn them into a pedestrian you know, happiness zone with all the money they were making from charging the right price for parking. And it becomes this virtuous circle where the nicer it gets, the more people want to be there, the more they can charge, the more money they make, and the nicer it gets. So it's a very useful, um, oh, we'll talk about transit in a minute. So, um, so it would seem, reviewing, that you're, reviewing your document, that you understand fully market-based pricing, and you understand the different zones, um, and you understand the elimination of the on-site parking requirement, except for residential, because there still remains in Lati a requirement, even in the heart of the downtown, that developers, if they're building a, ha a house, an apartment house, have to provide about one space per unit, a little less than that, which is almost an American standard. That's how bad it is, it's American. <laughs> so, um, what does this do? Or why is this necessary? The typical reason why cities are unable to get rid of their on-site parking requirement for new buildings is because residents who already live there are afraid that they'll lose their on-street parking because they'll be crowding, right? They're so used to parking on street that if any new residents come and they don't have their own parking spaces below their building, then we will lose our on-street parking to them. So residents fight it. It turns out that the experience in cities that are no more walkable than, than Lati, in other American cities, actually not so different from Lati, has been surprising. In both Washington, D.C. and Somerville, Massachusetts, two very city, different cities that are very different from each other, um, we had the exact same thing happen, which was two developers came and built two buildings. <clears throat> one developer decided to provide one space per unit, and the other developer decided to provide no parking at all. The building that had the parking, everyone who moved into it came with a car, which they then parked on the street, and sometimes under the building. And then, of course, they gummed up the streets with traffic all day long. In the buildings that provided no parking, the new residents self-selected. Everyone who moved in came without a car. So the residents who fought this, you know, who fought for off-street parking ended up creating a huge problem for themselves whereas the residents who allowed a building with no parking ended up with a lot more neighbors, but no more cars. Of course, everyone wants more neighbors, no one wants more cars. So it was an important lesson there, and I think the next step Lati could take is to let the free market, let the developers decide how much parking their tenants need. But if you want young people living in your downtown, if you want more affordability in your downtown, then remove the, the parking requirement. And insist that developers decouple, the term is decouple, Parking costs from housing costs. So if someone's renting an apartment, it doesn't, come with it doesn't come with parking. If you're renting an apartment, you should also have to rent the parking. If you buy an apartment, you should also have to buy the parking. If you don't do that, the non-drivers, the cyclists, are subsidizing the drivers, because everyone's paying for it, whether they drive or not, right? So we have to remove these hidden incentives to drive. And the biggest one is the available parking and, the, of course, the free parking. That's parking, we're done with parking. The final part of the useful walk, of course, is transit. And I can't talk to Lati about transit because even as, a, even as a Finnish city that probably thinks it has worse transit than Helsinki, I mean, than other Finnish and European cities, your transit is much better than the typical American city by a long shot. But it's just important to remember that transit is one of the key things that makes a city, a city walkable and useful. Because in fact, most cities have 
separate walkable areas that aren't necessarily walkable to each other. And most people will not choose to live in just one part of the city, right? I mean, they'll pick a place to live, but they wanna have access. They wanna have access to the whole city. They wanna be able to meet people from all over the city. So even if you live in a very walkable area like downtown, if you wanna meet everyone in the city and you can't get to the other walkable parts of the city without a car, then you're gonna buy a car. And what happens in the US is that we buy our cars and then the whole landscape has to reshape itself around the fact that we're all driving our cars. So in this case, you have a waterfront that's very attractive, and it's some distance from your downtown, which is very attractive. Not many people are going to walk that, even though it's not that far. Many more will bike it, and that's why it's really important that your waterfront downtown access be a designated bike access. But the key, the key connection, I would say, is a, is a bus, and we were talking this afternoon about actually having a special trolley, a cute, a cute trolley. You know, a trolley that's branded and marketed and looks different from your buses, that's nothing but a downtown waterfront connection, just to really allow you to fall into that lifestyle of not driving, but getting from one to the other. So, <clears throat> that's the reason to walk. The safe walk is the biggest category, and we're gonna spend most of the rest of our time on the safe walk. We don't talk about crime anymore. In the US, the safe walk used to always be about crime, and now we don't mention crime because crime is, is not the issue. The issue is feel, feeling like you have a fighting chance against being squished by an automobile. And it's made up of about, of about 100 different moving parts, um, many of which many cities still don't get right. The first is block size. This is Portland, Oregon. Have you heard of Portland, Oregon from me? Famously walkable, famously 200-foot blocks, right? These are tiny blocks. They're about the smallest in America. This is Salt Lake City. Anyone been to Salt Lake City? No hurry. <laughs> famously, famously unwalkable. Famously 600-foot 600 600-foot 600 blocks. And here they are side by side. Humans made both these places. They're so different from each other. But the main lesson is that in most places, a 200-foot block city can be a two-lane city. Portland is mostly a two-lane city. And a 600-foot block city is about a six-lane city. And in, Portland, in Salt Lake City, there are certain intersections that give you, a yellow, they give you a, an orange flag to hold above your head when you cross the street. Because the streets are like highways. Look at this. This is 24 different California cities as the average block size doubled, the average number of fatal crashes not on highways almost quadrupled. So there's a clear inverse relationship between block size and safety. These are your blocks. Here's 100 meters. Here you are next to Portland. And again, these are about the tiniest in America. So you're doing really well. Your blocks are very small and maybe by European standards, they're not that small. If you go to Rome, you know, a block in Rome's about this big. <laughs> so it's all relative. But this is where we say your, your bones are good. This is your downtown grid. Obviously, it begins to dissipate a bit as you leave the city center. But you've got the framework which says there's no reason why your streets can't all be very walkable. So good start. The next, of course, is the number of lanes. Um, this is a conversation that pertains to highways. It also pertains to city streets. And this is a conversation I have wherever I go because it's the most important conversation in traffic planning that still is this big black hole in terms of people's thinking. And it's the concept of an induced demand. What ideal traffic planning tells us is that this is, this is volume, this is capacity, this is traffic. So in anticipation of increased volume, we widen the street to absorb the traffic. But this is what happens. Because of what we call latent trips, the trips that weren't happening because of the traffic. And the key sentence is that in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. Right? It's the principal way that we pay the price in our lives for driving. 
is being stuck in traffic. Now, if your system's not congested, this doesn't apply. But all over the US, and I know also in Europe, there's a bunch of, in fact, right outside of Lati, there are streets that are slightly congested, where congestion is the argument for widening them. Let's make the two-laner a four-laner, because we're starting to feel a little bit of congestion. And what you have to realize is that it is precisely the increased number of lanes that are inducing the additional trips. People move further from work, they stop carpooling, they stop taking transit, they stop biking, and they make all these decisions based on the fact they no longer have to wait in traffic. So you widen it again, and the traffic comes again and again. And in America, we've had this experience now for about 40 years. This is Newsweek magazine. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. And I read this, and I jumped for joy that it was in Newsweek magazine. But then I landed, and I said, who are these engineers? And may I please meet some of them? Because I wasn't coming across them. And the, the, the story is actually, most engineers understand this, but their population, you don't. Now, you came here, so you do. <laughs> but the people don't. And they get stuck on a street, and they call them up, and they say, we need more lanes, because most people don't understand induced demand, because it's a little bit counterintuitive. So we need to build the extra lanes, because the traffic is coming. And then you build the extra lanes, and the traffic comes, and they say, see, I told you we, we needed those lanes. So this is the study. It was presented at the Paris School of Economics. Um, I have no idea what this means, but I know what this means. It's that the data shows very clearly that when you, create, when you add a lane to a highway, for example, or a street, 40% of the capacity gets taken up right away. And within about four years, 100% of the capacity is absorbed with new trips. In the US, Metro areas that invested heavily in road capacity expansion fared no better in easing congestion than those that did not. So you have cities like New York and Boston and Philadelphia, which stopped building more highways. <clears throat> and then you have cities like Nashville and Orlando and, and Salt Lake City and Atlanta that built, spent billions of dollars on highways. And the result is, those people who live in that latter group of cities are just driving further and further and further and spending more on transportation with no less congestion. So this is not unusual. Houston is an extreme. But you feel bad about your one highway? I mean, this is not unusual. These are all huge, elevated highways. And I spoke in Houston recently, and I said, you know, in thousands of years from now, these will be our pyramids, right? These will be the ruins that people wonder what our great society was thinking. But we just know we can stop. But there's a separate conversation. So, so whenever I go to a community, I talk about induced demand, and then I give up on induced demand, because it's so hard to convince people. I say, OK, uh, even if we can't make any progress with induced demand, let's talk about something else, which is you probably have some streets that aren't congested. You probably have some streets that are a lot wider than they need to be. Let's find those streets, because that's money in the bank. That's a resource. That's a public space that's being underutilized. So that's what happened in Oklahoma City. This is prevention. You know, it's a health magazine. They named their best walking cities. Oklahoma City, though, was named the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country. <laughs> How horrible for the mayor who came running to me and said, Jeff, what can we do? And I said, let's do our first, let's do a walkability study. And we invented this concept called a walkability study. Now I've done about 14 of them. And the first thing I did was I looked at the car counts. This is downtown Oklahoma City. You can see these numbers, 5,000, 3,000. These are the number of cars per day on these streets. Now we know that a two-lane street, two-lane street, no turn lanes, just two-lane street, can handle 10,000 cars per day, or 1,000 cars peak hour. We just know that. No one disputes it. And these were the streets in the downtown grid that were much bigger than that. 6,800, 9,700, 7,000, 7, 3,200, These were streets. In, they, had a, they had a brand new downtown plan where these were, these were designated to be repaved and improved at four to six lanes, and look at these car counts. So I told them, I said, you have, a print, you have a fundamental disconnect, a disconnection 
between the supply and the demand. There's no induced demand happening here, right? You've got six lanes, maybe 30,000 cars per day of capacity, and it's holding 8,000 cars per day. So fortunately, roughly the same day that my report came out, uh, Devon Energy, a big oil and gas company, decided to build a 50-story tower in the heart of the downtown. And that tower, that investment in the downtown was gonna generate about $200 million in, extra, in tax increment. Right? The taxes to the city from this investment were generating a, a, a cash flow which had a present value of about $200 million. And they said, what should we spend that money on? On the same day my report came out. So they decided that they were gonna rebuild they're gonna rebuild the whole city downtown core, about 45 blocks from building face to building face. Not restripe, rebuild. And it was my job on the team to basically design the curb to curb, you know, the, the driving area, driving, biking, of every street. So we took a principally four lane system, we made it, princi well, principally four to six and made it two to four. <clears throat> we, took a, we doubled the amount of on-street parking because when you remove travel lanes, they're available for on-street parking. By the way, I think Europeans undervalue how much on-street parking is worth to retailers, to shops. The retail expert Bob Gibbs in the US says that every on-street parking space is worth about $150,000 to $200,000 in revenue to a nearby shop. So we doubled the amount of on-street parking and we created a, they had no bike system whatsoever, and we put in a pretty robust bike system. So a street like this, four lanes to nowhere, becomes a street like this. Here it is under construction. A street like this, this had to be still four lanes, but not five, and we could add bike facilities as well. And this is an odd example because they're, they're spending a lot of money. And so when I show this around the US, I, be sh I also show them other examples which aren't so expensive. But they're going from being a completely unwalkable city to a pretty walkable city in a very short, very short order because of all that extra capacity they had that was wasted. So good way to invest your money. Good way to invest your oil and gas money <laughs> in becoming more walkable. <clears throat> so you have streets that might have once had a reason to be big that no longer have as much reason to be big. And you look at this street, and I asked how many cars per day on this street? Because this street is one, two, three, four, five, it's five to six lanes. And my understanding is it's about 15,000 cars per day, which is easily handled in three lanes. So this lane could be something else. It could be a buffered bike lane. It could be a parking lane. Maybe the cars wouldn't have to park on the sidewalk they could park in the street. But it's a, uh, my, uh, you have to do the numbers more carefully, but I am suspecting that the numbers will make it clear that you can remove at least two lanes from this street. <clears throat> Another piece of it, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven lanes. Seven lanes, this could probably be three lanes. You could probably take two lanes out for parking and two lanes out for biking and the street would probably be big enough. Now what happens if you resize the street somewhere around its current volume? It means you're not inviting new trips. It means, doesn't mean you're not inviting growth, it just means you're inviting growth around transit and biking. And it means that people will drive the right speed because what I forgot to mention at the beginning of this is, of course, the wider the street is, the faster people go, the more it looks like a highway, the further distance you have to cross, the more chance of your being hit, right? So it's important for safety. Next is one-way streets. And now I'm talking just about multi-lane one-way streets. Two lanes, three lanes, of which you have a couple. All over the US now, we are rever we, well, first of all, we did something crazy, which was in the 1960s and 70s, almost every American city with a downtown network converted that network to one-way pairs to speed people in and out of the city at rush hours. <clears throat> Thinking, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna, you know, in the 60s, the American cities were really suffering for a whole bunch of reasons. We want to invite suburbanites into the city. We want to make it easy for them to use the city, so we'll 
make all of our streets one way so they can get in and out really fast, which of course caused them to get out but not back in. And why do these streets feel unsafe? Well, it's the sheer momentum of all these vehicles going in one direction, the fact that there's no opposing traffic, which is the sort of friction that slows cars down. You know, you step out into the street and one lane stops for you and blocks your view of the other lane that doesn't, right? But mostly it's because of that second lane. Whenever there's another lane, your role as a driver switches because you have that, the term in English is to jockey, right? To jockey from lane to lane. Because there is that choice to, instead of sitting behind the car in front of you, to actually pass. And I don't know about you, but whatever lane I'm in is always the slower lane. So you have to switch. And your mindset as a driver changes fundamentally from someone who's looking around, checking out the stores, the girls, the boys, you know, the people, to someone who's just trying to play that game of getting home quickly. And so that's, why, that's the main reason why one-ways are so bad. But the other story is how bad one-ways are for business. And this is a story that was published in Governing Magazine in the US in 2009 that really got the conversation going. And it was about this small town called Vancouver, Washington. And they tried all the tricks, all the planning tricks of the 80s to bring back their downtown. The bricks, the berms, the banners, the balloons, the bandstands, the bollards. They call them the six Bs. And nothing was helping the downtown until finally they got permission and they made the street two-way. And when they made the street two-way, the number of cars per day stayed the same. The, the uh, revenues to all the merchants doubled. Now, why is this? Well, it's, again, it's what drivers are looking at when they have the opportunity to jockey. It's because, you know, what if that one way home from work, well, what if, what if the one way past all the stores is on the way to work and not on the way home from work? Well, who shops on the way to work? Nobody. So they distribute vitality unevenly, right? But, most, but then also think about when you go through an intersection on a one-way street, these stores back here never get seen, ever, by a driver. So there's all these reasons. So now we have a lot of data. This is East Broad Street in Savannah, Georgia. It was converted to one way in 1969. 64% of the tax-paying businesses on that street just disappeared. They fell off the tax rolls. They stopped paying taxes because they were gone. It was reverted back to two-way in 1990, and they got 50% more businesses almost right away. Then a brand new study from last year in Louisville, Kentucky. These were all one-way streets. Brooks, first, second, and third. Brooks and first were reverted to two-way. Second and third were kept as one-way. The two-ways, car crashes went down 48%, crime went down 23%. The one-ways, car crashes went up, and crime went up. So now we have all the data we need. So this is a more typical story then, quickly. The anti-Oklahoma city, this is Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Nice little downtown, but I like to say <coughs> they have a, a Portland grid and they had Salt Lake City streets. The typical street was a one-way four lane and the volumes were very, very low. Two lane or less, 6,000 cars per day on every street except this one, which is a state highway. So we said, let's, let's restripe it. And they were about to spend $3 million, they were about to spend $3 million to rebuild this one street. And I said, instead of rebuilding, let's restripe. If you restripe, you can restripe a whole downtown for the price of rebuilding one street. And so we go from this to this, see the difference? Four lanes and half one way to two lanes and all two way. Here's the parking before. Red is angled and yellow is parallel from this to this because we have all that extra space to use up. And a bike system from this to this because of the extra space. So we're building that now slowly. And we're not, we didn't do it all at once, just as they repave and fix up their streets over about a five-year span that we're halfway through, they're slowly converting them all. And of course, there have been no traffic problems or anything else. 
This is another place I'm working, New Albany, Indiana. This is the citizens, I didn't do this. This isn't my side. But the citizens have risen up and they realize that they'll be better off and the merchants, they'll be better off with two-way streets. So in Lati or wherever else you might be, think about that. So here's an easy win. You have streets like this. There's one. This is a four-lane street. What I'm about to show you is called the Classic American Road Diet. The Classic American Road Diet is a win-win-win. Here's what you do. You go from this to this. Don't worry about moving the curb, but you turn a four-laner to a three-laner. Here, four-lane four roads are extremely dangerous and inefficient because the left-hand turn lane is also the fast lane. So there's all sorts of jockeying, there's all sorts of conflict. This car stops to let you turn, and this car hits you, right? Very dangerous. So when you do this, you just create a center turn lane that's two-way. When you're away from inter intersection, you can put a median in with trees, right? But it's a three-lane street. There's no opportunity to pass. This didn't surprise anybody. Injuries drop precipitously when you make this change. But this is the big surprise. This is the traffic before and this is after. These are 17 different streets that were all road dieted from three lanes, sorry, from four lanes to three, except for one. This one went from six lanes to five. But all the rest from four lanes to three. And what do you see? There's no drop in capacity. So you lose a lane, make it safer. You get, you get something. You get a bike lane or two bike lanes or a parking lane or something else, and you lose no volume. But the other thing I want you to notice is what are these numbers? Because they're all more cars per day than you've got on your seven laner, right? So that's a lesson also. On the, so this, this street, it could be that the car count suggests this should only be two lanes. But chances are, the safe thing, no risk, is to make it three lanes. Cycling. Who am I to tell you about cycling? I mean, I've learned a bunch of stuff, but I certainly don't represent a country that's done very much about cycling at all. But we have a real lesson in Portland, Oregon, and other places. Portland is the best example. I, you know, we've been talking about Portland, they commute 15 times as much as the rest of the US. So I asked my friend Tom Brennan from Portland to send me some pictures of the bike commute, and he sent me these images. You know, it looks like a, a Scandinavian city, right? I said, what, was this bike to work day? Because we have that in the US, we have the annual bike to work day. I said, no, it's just Tuesday in Portland. But the lesson we've learned from Portland and other places is that the bike population is principally a function of the bike infrastructure. And in Portland, they paid about $2 million per year for about 30 years. So actually, over time, $60 million, it's a lot of money. Half the price of the one highway cloverleaf that they rebuilt. But, you know, $60 million. And what they did was they went from biking pretty much the same as the rest of America to biking 15 times as much. Other cities like Chicago now are doing this. And this is the gold standard. This is called the buffered bike lane. It's also called a cycle track, but buffered bike lane pulls better with drivers. If you're trying to sell this to drivers, you call it a buffered bike lane and not a cycle track. This was a three lane road. The parking is pulled off the curb and put in this aisle and the parking protects the bicycles from the cars that are moving and this is the door buffer so you don't get hit. Here's one in New York City, from three lanes to two lanes, protected cycle track. Number of cyclists tripled, of course. Speeding dropped from 75% to 17% of all drivers, which is a lot. Injury crashes to all users, principally drivers. This is mostly drivers who are having their lives saved. Injury crashes down precipitously. Interestingly, just as many cars are moving through this street as before, as quickly as before. We're not sure why, but it works. So, 
you know, even traditionally automotive cities like Long Beach, California, they're creating these cycling populations by creating the bike lanes. Instead, though, we have this thing in America called vehicular cycling. Have you heard of vehicular cycling? Vehicular cycling has been the dominant frame of thought for cycling in America for about 40 years. And it's why we're so bad at cycling. Because there's this concept that, you know, bike lanes are separate and unequal. And why should I have to be pushed over to the side of the road? And so the most vocal and politically active cyclists in the US for decades were these folks who said, no, you know, the bicycle is a vehicle, like a car, and every lane is a bike lane. But if every lane is a bike lane, then really no lane is a bike lane. And you don't generate the biking population. In the US, at least, particularly the women and children. You don't get the women and children biking in, in any significant number without designated lanes. So, you know, this is Pasadena, and this is the only cyclist I met in Pasadena. I mean, there are no cyclists except for this guy, because there's no bike lanes. It's not a cult. Uh, this is in Washington, D.C., where we have the buffered bike lane, and this is a cleaning service. Do you have these in Europe, the cleaning ladies on bikes? Do we have something on you here? And then, you know, Denver tech companies, the number one thing they want is bike lanes. And this is Copenhagen. <laughs> but the message is, you know, weather, weather is a factor, but it's not the dominant factor. These are the 50 American states, from the warmest to the coldest. And this line, which bears no relationship whatsoever to the temperature, is the number of cyclists, because it's a function of infrastructure, right? So, you know, you have your issues. You, know, you have your times when the bike lane isn't going to work. But you can do what Copenhagen does and plow it first. Um, and I think what, you, what, your, what your tendency here would be, would be to accept that there will be some days per year that, some, that most people won't bike, but that most of the days of the year, you will have a significant biking population. And so it's important to have the dedication to take care of those lanes. As, much as you take care of the, the car lanes. They're all lanes. Next is parallel parking, which I've talked about a little bit. But it's something I, something I often see missing in European cities. I really believe, based on experience, that parallel parking is a vital barrier of steel between the moving vehicles and the people on the curb. I used to joke that you can't have sidewalk dining without parallel parking. And then I saw Fort Lauderdale, famous for its happy hour. This is happy hour in Fort Lauderdale. Notice you can park on this side of the street, and you can't park on this side of the street. This is happy hour on the parked side. This is happy hour on the unparked side. It really makes a difference. And then, you know, you guys have it, but it's like it's on the sidewalk, <laughs> which is very strange. And it's better. It's better to have these people on the sidewalk than to not have them at all. But I think certainly they should really be out here. And the question is, do the excess lanes make it possible to have them out there? And yeah, Joanna, you mentioned they sometimes park at an angle, which makes it look like you're about to get hit when you're on the sidewalk. Uh, and then the other part of this picture, of course, is the street, street trees which Lati does a pretty good job of, and I know for many years you've had a policy that was strong in supporting street trees, but they are so important, and they have a lot of, they, they provide what we call an e ecosystem service that we aren't, if we were able to monetize, if we were able to get paid, if we were able to collect the money that the street trees provide us, or at least be able to identify the money that street trees save us, we would be planting them everywhere. For example, street trees, absorb the first inch of every rainfall, which takes a ton of pressure off of your stormwater system. They also you know, lower heat islands in the summer, in your brief summer. They lower your urban heat islands. They absorb CO2, they absorb ozone, and they, they uh, cause retailers to sell more stuff for more money, and they increase the value of houses. In Portland, Oregon, where they measure all these things, um, having a big street tree near your house is worth as much in home value as having an extra bedroom. So it's really worth something. 
and the city collects that. They also slow cars down, sometimes dramatically. But this is important because the, the, the belief among traffic planners for years in the U.S. Ha was and remains, still remains, that street trees make streets more dangerous for drivers because the cars might hit them. But we finally have the study, and one of which was done in Orlando, Florida, the study which measured two stretches of the same street. And one stretch had street trees and the other didn't. And guess what? Where there are no trees, there are more accidents and more injuries because people are driving faster. So street trees actually make streets safer. And they also protect pedestrians from cars that are going off the road. <clears throat> so, you know, this is a street that, it's not all that unusual in Europe. Not all your streets are going to have trees. And there are some streets that are nice and tight, and they've got, you know, two lanes that aren't very big. They've got parallel parking. And this is a condition where you don't need street trees. But on your wider streets, you do. I should mention also, notice there's not much of a center line, if any. This is brand new data. You know, we learn things every year. They just did a study in England. When you take the center line out of a street, you slow cars down by seven miles per hour because they don't want to hit each other and they're not clear which their lane is. The center line says to you as a driver, oh, if I stay in my lane, I won't hit anyone. So if there's no center line, you actually drive more carefully. So that's another trick that you should remember. And then, you know, all the little details. I call this objective journalism. Some say the entrance to city center is not inviting to pedestrians. Oh, really? <laughs> but when it, we were discussing this earlier, whenever, the, whenever there are swoops, stream form geometrics, aerodynamic shapes, it says this is a place for cars, not a place for people, which is why I don't like roundabouts in, in shopping districts, you know, big swoopy roundabouts. They might be safe, but they don't communicate walking. So here's your problem area, the worst, the swoopiest. It isn't just all the cars coming through, it's the speed of the cars and the impression that they give to the drivers because it's been arranged like a highway. It's not unlike that slide I showed you earlier with the, all the streets coming together, right? And I'm convinced the right solution here, although it's an expensive one, is simply, and I'm sure the number of cars per day would fit, is simply run a two-lane, two, it would be a roundabout, but it wouldn't, have the, it wouldn't have the shape of a roundabout. But essentially take all traffic in two lanes counterclockwise around this intersection, which would leave you a giant green in the middle. And it would function like one big roundabout, but not shaped like a roundabout. And then this so important connection between your downtown and your waterfront would be walkable. So that's when you get some money, <laughs> when you have some extra cash to spend, um, putting a park here is an obvious solution, I believe. <clears throat> and then all the little details. We always talk about how the city has to be designed by generalists and not specialists. Because in the US, we've let the specialists take over everything. So yes, this, this street will be bone dry within 30 seconds of the 100-year flood. But what about the non-emergency condition? We can't forget what it's like to use every day. One issue I have in, in Europe, generally, is I think you tend to be overzealous with the street buttons. And I didn't notice in Lati. I've noticed a little bit in Helsinki. In, in the US, the walkable cities, it's very simple. The cars get the green and you get the green. The cars get the green and you get the green. But at every intersection, when you arrive, you can either go straight or left. You're never waiting. Now, there's this other thing called the LPI, the Lead Pedestrian Indicator, which actually gives the pedestrian the green light three seconds before the drivers. Do you have this here? So that's even better because it allows pedestrians to claim the intersection before the cars turn into it. But what doesn't work and what I see all over Europe is in, you know, this inconvenience in the name of safety that you get to an intersection and because cars are making different motions and you're supposed to be protected, you can neither go this way or that way. I recently walked in New York City from Central Park to Penn Station, probably a half an hour walk. I never stopped once. Because if I couldn't cross this way, I could cross that way. And mid-block, I could jaywalk, right, in between the lights. And jaywalking makes cities safer. 
Don't feel bad about jaywalking. It makes it safer for everybody. But the European light regimes, which make a condition exist where you're standing at an intersection and you can't go either way, is not good for walkability because the pedestrian needs to feel convenienced. And then, this is not real, this, well this is real, this is sculpture, this is not, this is art. This is, but there's a general discovery that we're over-signaled in America. And signalized intersections are more dangerous than unsignalized intersections. So, um, in Philadelphia, so here I'm going to talk about something called the four-way stop sign. I understand you don't have four-way stop signs here. We have them all over the U.S. And they're the safest intersections. Now, the European equivalent might just be the unmarked, the unmarked intersection where everyone looks to the right, right, and whoever's on the right goes first. But the idea that you come into an intersection and you're not told what to do, which the traffic engineers would say is crazy. You know, we need to control traffic, but in fact, when people enter, enter an intersection and don't know what to do, they are careful. And they slow down and there's eye contact, and the bikers go first, actually the pedestrians go first, then the bikers, and it all works out. So this is in Philadelphia, where they removed 472 signals from downtown Philadelphia and replaced them with stop signs. What they found was, from 199, which they tested, that crashes went down by a quarter, severe injury crashes went down 63%, and severe pedestrian injury crashes went down by 68%. By replacing signals, with stop signs. This is funny. Traffic engineers in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from elimination of the local habit of speeding up to beat the red. As if only in Philadelphia do they speed up to beat the red. So, this is Ben Hamilton Bailey. He gave me this video, which I haven't used yet. Hopefully it will load. I haven't used it because I can't sell this in America. It's the concept of naked streets. Now, this isn't a naked street, it's a very busy street. But notice there's no signs, no stop signs, no signals. And this was the brainchild of a fellow, a Dutch fellow named Hans Mondermann, who died about eight years ago. Hans Mondermann introduced naked streets in Holland. And he would create these very complicated, very busy intersections. And the news cameras would come, <coughs> the news cameras would come, and he'd talk to the reporters and then he'd walk slowly back into the intersection while he was talking. And of course the cars would part and slow down and everything worked out because people enter these intersections with great care because they're not labeled properly. And so Ben comes to our conferences in the US and our jaws drop and hit the floor and we say, we can't do that in America, but you can do it here. This is called Seven Dials, it's in London. And what you have here is a ton of people a ton of cars. Um, we're about to see an old man who doesn't really know where he is wander across the intersection. But this is, it's slow. It's very slow traffic, but no one, no one gets into any trouble because everyone is super careful. So let's observe for a minute. I'm not sure where the camera's standing exactly. Yeah, this fellow, he thinks he's going that way. And he looks around a bit. You know, and the car waits. No one's honking. So, you know, that's the naked streets phenomenon. And you guys are much more ready for it than we are. And since you don't have a history of stop signs, Maybe this is a better way to go. But you know that street I showed you which had the left-hand turn lane instead of the four lanes, the classic American road diet? When you don't have a signal, you actually, there's no reason to have that turn lane. Because if you think about it, everyone just takes their turn at a naked intersection or a four-way stop intersection. Everyone takes their turn. You're never stuck behind someone who's waiting to go left. So actually, having no signal allows you to not even need the stop sign, I mean the, the left-hand turn lane. Okay, that's it. This is where I was gonna end the talk, but because a lot, who, who am I not gonna see tomorrow?
Raise your hand. Okay, the rest of you cover your eyes <laughs> and ears. But I'm gonna talk about the last two categories because they're important. Every category counts, so the comfortable walk and the interesting walk. The comfortable walk is a little bit counterintuitive, especially for Americans. We all love our wide open spaces. We climb mountains and like our prairies and our long views. But actually, the evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals simultaneously seek both prospect and refuge. You want to be able to see your prey and your predators, and you need to know that your flanks are covered from attack. And this is in your bones, you can't help it. Right? The reason we've evolved, we still exist after millennia, is because we knew that we were most safe in places where your flanks were protected from a lion jumping on you. And so it's precisely places like this, this happens to be in, uh, in uh, Croatia, split, that we're drawn to places that have wonderful height to width ratios. And I always say a plaza is only as good as its edges, and a street is only as good as its walls. And so we new urbanists have been talking about this for some time now. And you know, there's your Renaissance ideal of one to one. Three to one is great. Beyond six to one, you start to lose your sense of enclosure, and you're no longer comfortable. So you know, one to six can be fantastic. This is Salzburg. The opposite of Salzburg is Houston. And the, actually Houston has come a long way since this slide. But the message here is that it is the surface parking lot which is the principal um, villain in this conversation. And when you're walking down a street and there's buildings, buildings, and all of a sudden the surface parking lot, that's where you tend to turn around and not walk any further because it's just not comfortable. It doesn't shape the space. And here we get into, you know, does this look familiar? It's certainly Scandinavian. But the modernist concept of the building as a sculptural object that stands free in the landscape to be admired, you know, like a Calder or a Brancusi, which is what you have west of downtown and all over Scandinavia, it creates a space that has no shape and doesn't hold you. As opposed to traditional fabric, that this could be downtown Helsinki or Lati, in which the buildings take whatever shape they need to in order to shape public spaces that are carefully made. And it's actually, the technical term is figural object versus figural space. Because we live in the spaces. When we're outside and we're experiencing culture, you know, civilization, bumping into each other, we're in the spaces, we're not in the buildings. And when you're inside a building, you don't necessarily feel the shape of the building anyway. So it's the shape of the spaces that matter. And so, you know, this collection, this, this is not, this is leftover space. It's not shaped space, as opposed to these beautifully shaped spaces. And then you have this also new development that began to return to the concept of the perimeter block. So the buildings aren't all that, aren't all that beautiful, uh, they're not very tall, unfortunately, if you know this area, but they do hold the street edge, which is a much, much better solution for creating that feeling of enclosure. And then, of course, you have this incredible planning history, thanks to Saarinen and others in Helsinki. And this is the idea, I mean, look at this. This is, could you say perimeter block more strongly than this image, this Saarinen image? Look, it's nothing but perimeter blocks. And when we did a project for the site of the Fornebu Airport in Oslo, we came in second, unfortunately. Um, that was exactly our model. It's a design we did, you know, just learning from Saarinen, but also creating great spaces between buildings. And then finally, the interesting walk. <coughs> This is, right, the Renaissance ideal, one-to-one. -one. This is also one-to-one. -one. This is the street in Grand Rapids that connects, Grand Rapids, Michigan, that connects the two best hotels in Grand Rapids. But no one wants to walk from the street, because when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck, and the other side is actually a conference facility that appears to have been designed in admiration for the parking deck, you know, it's just boring. And we humans were among the social, social primates 
Nothing interests us more than other humans. We need signs of humanity, doors and windows and stoops, and we can't let this happen. Right? This is Charleston, <coughs> South Carolina, where we learn it only takes you know, 10 meters of building to hide 100 meters of parking garage. This is one of my favorites. This is in South Beach in Miami. I call it the Chia Pet Garage, but you can see the shops are here up against the street edge that make all the difference. And then you have conditions also. Don't feel bad. Everyone does. But you, you, know, you, you need to have a rule on the books like many cities now do to not allow this to happen anymore because it's just boring, too boring. And then when you make a surface lot, you put it at the center of the block. So we're in the middle, it's the hole in the donut, right? We're in the middle of a block in a new town that we worked on. And you can see these are the backs, 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 backs. And the parking lot's just hidden where you can't see it from the street. So this is a project that I like to end with that teaches a few lessons. But this is called the Cap at Union Station in Columbus, Ohio. And here you have two different neighborhoods. This is the convention center. Uh, there's a big sports arena back here. The street connects them to the Short North. The Short North was a neighborhood, ethnic neighborhood, great restaurants and shops, but was near death because no one was walking. You know, lots of pedestrians, lots of conventioneers. No one was walking across the highway to this neighborhood because this is, this is what the bridge was. And it was your typical state highway bridge with the suicide screen and nothing else. And the bridge was falling apart, and the state had to rebuild it, and the city of Columbus paid $1.9 million to the state. And instead of building a, you know, a 20-meter bridge, they built a 70-meter bridge and in terms of its width, and they gave these sites for free to a private developer who built this. And now the two sides of the river are seamlessly connected. And the newspaper articles, not the planning journals, but the local newspaper articles say that it's because of this bridge that the short north is now the hottest neighborhood and the best real estate in Columbus. So clearly, what do we have? We have prospect, we have refuge, we have comfort, we have interest. Um, we have all four of these things. But I think another lesson is that whenever you can connect, whenever you have a walkable district, this is the lesson of your nasty mixing bowl intersection. Whenever you have a walkable district and a walkable district and something between them that's not so great, that's where the investment makes the most difference. Connecting walkability to walkability is the biggest bang for your buck for getting a greater walkable culture in your city. So that's the whole list. And uh, if you want to learn more, that's the book. If you want to learn a lot more, these are the other two books I would recommend to you. Suburban Nation is really the, the story of those two models of growth, town versus sprawl. And then the Smart Growth Manual, we like to say the Smart Growth Manual was, writ was written to be read by a developer on one single cross-continental airplane flight. So it's all the stuff that you need to know, but in a very compact form with a picture on every page and all those things that people with short attention spans need to read. Um, so that's it. Please follow me on Twitter. Um, if you want to communicate with me, uh, that's the way to do it. And um, I thank you for your attention. I understand that questions are welcome. Do you want to hand this around? Behind you. All right, does anybody have any questions to ask Jeff? Okay, Yanni. Absolutely, we do, of course. Thank you very much, it was spectacular. Um, one very concrete question about the good place to be on the sidewalk you know, when you showed this nice picture of the restaurant tables behind the parking. 
and it's an example where the parking can be, can be also for the good. Uh, so, um, so it was all right that you spent such a lot of time <laughs> on parking after all. Um, why do you think the people like it there beside the, the parked cars? Is it also because they feel safe or did they come there by car? So is it actually the function of, of being able to park beside the restaurant that counts? That's it's one. both. It's clear that for, um, for all merchants, but particularly for what we call you know, soft goods, clothing and tourist items and all of that stuff, um, the curbside parking is very valuable. But particularly, you know, it's very unlikely that those sidewalk diners parked in those spots. They probably parked a little bit further down the block or around the corner. Um, but mostly it's, it is simply having that barrier that protects you. Yeah, I, I have no doubt about that. Okay, please. Good opportunity. <coughs> have the experience with the social campaigns changing the culture of people, making them um, more um, well, open for walking and biking? No. Um, so do you, <laughs> do you believe that the changing the architecture of the city, uh, the planning, this auto-regulates the... the I think city? social campaigns are important and useful, um, but I've never counted on them. Um, the most effective one we have in the U.S. is a safe routes to school. Do you have that here? Safe routes to school or some other name for it. Um, but ultimately, even that campaign is tied up in physical design, that it isn't just parents teaching their children to walk more safely or teaching themselves or others to drive more safely, but also to look at the design of the environment and identify where it needs to be improved. The other big social campaign, if you, which is also a design campaign, um, or should be, or needs to be, is the 20 is plenty movement. Are you familiar with that? It's all over Europe, but particularly in England. Uh, and in fact, it would have to be 30 is not dirty, or something like that, for kilometers. But it's big in London, and it's um, 20 miles per hour. The entire center city of London is a 20 mile an hour zone. And New York City has, introdu has introduced a 20 mile an hour zone, which is about 30 kilometers per hour. But um, that's very useful, but the environment has to reinforce that. So just setting speed limits. The whole reason why all of these environmental cues that I talked about, the number of lanes, the direction of travel, the opportunity to jockey, the presence of trees, the parked cars, the reason why they're all so important is that people don't they don't drive the speed limit, they drive the speed at which they feel safe driving. And so um, I'm much more, I have much more interest in environmental cues than in campaigns, but both, both have their purpose. You mentioned that you have developed this um, tool, this walkability study. Could you tell a bit more about it, how, it, how what it's combined with? Uh, the walkability study uses that framework of the four steps of walkability to look at where cities are strong or, and weak. And every one I do is different from the one before because different cities have different strengths or weaknesses. Um, in terms of the useful walk, it looks at opportunities for balancing uses, identifying what they are and where they need to be. In terms of the safe walk, well, that's the majority of the report. And the safe walk looks at everything, but the, almost always the principal thing it does is identify mismatch between supply of lanes and demand for lanes, and then redesigns every street with paint. Almost never with construction, but almost always with paint. And so in a typical downtown grid, which might have 30 streets, we actually redesign every street. How would we restripe it? In so doing, we tend to create a pretty big bike network, because that's another part of the discussion. Then finally, in terms of the comfortable and interesting walk, <clears throat> we identify the key anchors in a downtown, the cinema, the parking structure, the central business district, the, um, uh, you know, any, anything that draws, maybe a, a school, uh, any place that's more, the, the, the um, bus terminal or the train station, anything that's likely to, to release or receive pedestrians, and we find the streets that connect them 
and then we find the, the missing teeth in those streets. Understanding that, people, that the walk needs to be comfortable and interesting as well as safe and useful, we, we reach the conclusion then that those streets that connect the meaningful anchors are the place where we need to first invest in making good edges. And then we ask the city, both the private sector and the public sector, to circle the wagons around those sites and say these are the 12 most important, or whatever the number is, these are the 12 most important sites in our downtown and we're actually gonna use every tool at our disposal to build there first. And that's in a nutshell of how those work. They tend to be about 110 pages. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, I think one problem in, in Finnish cities and other cities abroad is that we know a lot about walking and how to promote walking and plan for walking, but it's just the actions that we lack of. We don't, the municipalities or the cities don't really do the right actions to get more people walking. So what do you think are the key issues in actually coming from words to, to actions? Well, I may not have made it obvious enough that most of the things that I've done or that we have done in the US have been fought at every turn and barely succeeded, if at all. <laughs> and that for everything I show you that we've succeeded at, there's three others that didn't, or at least one other that didn't. Um, public opinion is very hard to sway. I have to say that the trend has been very positive, and it gets, it gets easier every year. One thing I tell mayors and city councilors that's clearly true is that any idea you have for changing a city will get more negative feedback than positive feedback, always. Why? Well, happy people are quieter than unhappy people, right? If you're unhappy, you're noisy, you show up, you fight it. So I was working in Des Moines, which is the capital of Iowa, and the city leaders want more bike lanes. The city staff wants more bike lanes. Everyone I met, of course, they're the people like you who come out, but everyone who I met wanted more bike lanes, but they were convinced they couldn't add more bike lanes because public opinion was against bike lanes. Well, what's, how did you gauge your public opinion? Well, when we were thinking about putting a bike lane on this street, we put up a website and we invited people to comment. Well, who's going to comment? You know, there's a small group of bicyclists who might comment, but they see it as a plus, so they're not angry. Then there's dozens of drivers who just want to get into the city as fast as they can and out of the city as fast as they can. And they're the ones who were writing and writing and writing and writing. And then there's the 60% of the population, the silent majority, who probably doesn't care very much, but really wouldn't mind it. But it was the city's perception based on who had responded to the open call for comment that it wasn't popular. They, have, they, they turn one, lane, one street from a three-laner, sorry, from a four-laner into a three-laner, and there was like a death a year on that street, and now no one's died for four years, and still people are polling 60% against the change. <laughs> because of who they're asking. So I think it's really important to do accurate polling, but also, also to understand that change is hard, and you, ha you have to work with public officials to develop a mutual understanding in the public arena that resistance is to be expected, and you can't just respond to those few people who choose to show up. You have to find a way to do polling that's actually scientific and not just random. Or actually, is random is scientifically random and not those who choose to get mad. But also, you know, cities have goals, and I'm sure your city plan is like most American city plans, that you want to be a healthier community, that you want to be a more sustainable community, you want to be a more economically strong community. And if those are goals that's embraced in your plan, which came from a public planning effort, then you've done your work, and now it's your job to start making choices that reinforce those conclusions. Yes? 
Yes, thanks a lot for your presentation. I just loved it. And uh, thanks also for Johanna and others for, for inviting Jeff. Um, uh, I don't know if you discussed about uh, the city center of Lahti. There is now this big discussion on what to do uh, for the main street, Alexander and Katu, and uh, how to make it walkable, if we should make it a kind of walking district. Um, you mentioned um, some data um, about, uh, because it, there is this uh, question that retailers co complain if you cannot if you cannot drive right in front of the of, of the shop, mm -hmm. um, uh, do you know about walking districts and uh, and the kind of retailers? Yeah. If you have data about this, so I did a design for that an hour ago that I'm very excited about. <laughs> However, I forgot. I neglected Johanna. I neglected to say the main thing, which is. Whatever you do, don't build it expensively and then hope that it works out. Like the big mistake we did in the US is we converted 200 streets from driving to pedestrian, all very beautifully, very expensively, and expensive to change back, right? We spent millions bringing in all of this landscape to all these streets, and 180 of them failed right away. 150 of them were converted back. Um, there's now only about 10 that are any good. And that's actually why I'm poorly positioned to advise you, because I know that pedestrian sectors, like you find in Copenhagen, work much better in Europe than in the US. Because in the US, the merchants are so much more dependent on the drive-by shopping than on the pedestrian and the transit shopping. I mean, in New York City, we could do a pedestrian district San Francisco, Boston, we can do it. But <clears throat> our experience in the US is that they haven't succeeded. But the main lesson I want to take from that isn't that they can't work, but that you should test it cheaply. So you've already, you're already experimenting with different types and amounts of traffic on your different streets. Just use plants. You know, it's what we did on Fifth Avenue, not me personally, but in the US. We put plants in pots and we blocked traffic and we put chairs out and did other stuff that cost almost nothing. And then we tested it and made sure the merchants didn't suffer. So that's the most important thing, is that you don't build it expensively before you know how it's going to work. But secondarily, I think there's a nice plan that makes your main east-west street, um, is it east, no, what's the one that's currently pedestrian? It's north-south, that connects the city hall axis to the top of the hill. Rautatienkatu, yeah, which, which connects the transit hub with the, with the city center. So I think that makes sense as a, as a longer pedestrian access. And then there's the question, how do you connect that access, access to the central green? Which I think makes sense to be two short connectors that reach two, sorry, central square, central plaza. The market square. The market square. Two connectors on either side of the square, but that stop at the square from that access to the square. And that makes sense as a little H, a little connective H, the letter H. Um, but I, I, you know, there's no reason if you achieve success with that, that you shouldn't consider making it bigger. But I think, you, you know, start small, test it slowly. The other thing I want to say about testing is that any sort of these, any sort of these proposals that come up about road diets, about removing lanes, the engineers will tell you, and I don't mean the city hall engineers, I just mean people in general. Engineers will tell you that you need to do a traffic study. And a traffic study costs tens of thousands of dollars and more importantly, four months to do. When you can just park a police car in one lane and a police car in another lane and turn a two laner to a four laner, you know, for nothing, for free. Now, the first day you do that, there will be a traffic problem, which is why you need to do it for a week, or at least three or four days. But don't spend you know, 50,000 euro on a traffic study where you can just park two cruisers, two police cars, for an evening rush hour for a week. And generally, traffic studies are, are wrong any, well, they tend to be right because they tell you to build more, which you build, and then the cars come. But generally, traffic studies are, you know, are not trustworthy. 
Yes, we will use this information next time we negotiate with those who demand traffic studies from us. Yeah. I come from the city of Tampere, and we traveled all the way with a single family car here to listen Excellent. to you. Uh, uh, we are planning a tram line, and we're work, working with this that kind of project, which is totally something like I could have never believed that I would be working on. And we have, for that reason, we are working on the parking policy. I've been working with all the doctrines that I have gained from the UTECO courses, uh, two years for the parking policy as an architect with engineers. And we have just uh, collected the co opinions uh, uh, from the citizens. We have uh, gathered 100 opinions from people, mostly that want to uh, like make sure that they have enough space for their parkings. Yeah. And then we have, uh, we have gotten 40 uh, statements from all the local officials, like the uh, local or the region museum, who was worried about <coughs> that we are going to lose this majestic lanes that are approaching these sub-centers like Hervanta and Tesama, which have these two plus two lanes and the trees, uh, the street trees, because they are like white and really like architectural history. <laughs> and I was like wordless. I, I'm still th processing while listening to you how I'm going to answer the, these statements. Well, I would say a hundred... You said collected a hundred opinions. That's not very many opinions. That's not too many, but yeah. still so I something. Wonder, I wonder if they were representative of the broader public opinion. But um, the the other thing I tell cities before they do any sort of plan in a downtown that will either be new development or to change the parking requirements is to do something that I call a parking preservation plan. Like call it that parking preservation plan, where you assure. Because the tools exist and they the, the tools exist and, and they work. You assure the local citizens you will not lose what you now have. Because if you now I mean I had this experience in Washington. We relied on parking on street in our house. We had no other place to park. And it was getting harder and harder and harder, and we citizens raised a, a voice, and they created a parking permit program where we get permits and new residents don't, and it now works perfectly well, and we're very happy. So the tools exist to preserve the parking that people, people's fear of losing is causing them to fight development. But you need to do that first, preserve the parking first, and then do the planning. So there's less fear. And you won't convince everyone. Yes, but this is an interesting phenomenon that uh, that wide streets would become a subject for conservation, for aesthetic purposes. Oh, or for someone's historical decided purposes. that they're uh, historic. Because yeah, they're histor They have historic value as a <coughs> cultural environment, mm. and that you couldn't you you couldn't put your streets on a diet for because they have cultural value. I've never heard of that. <laughs> is this the Stalin LA? No, in Berlin. One more? Anyone else? There's a I yeah, I work with WHO Healthy Cities, and actually I came from Turku to listen to you, so three hours by train. Um, very valuable um, addition to what in Healthy Cities is called healthy urban planning. Um, we work a lot with that, and actually um, you, you, you reinforced um, a lot of messages. I wanted to ask if you've heard about the tool developed by the World Health Organization called Health Economic Assessment Tool. No. It's a, it was actually developed also um, in cooperation with the Finnish expert, and it's a tool which is online, it's for free. I don't know if any of you, yeah, if you use it in Lahti, they use it, for example, in London nowadays. Um, it helps to um, calculate how many years of people's life is being saved because they walk and bike. Nice. Yeah. So in, it's the health assessment. But then you can calculate it in economic terms and you can actually get the value that if you put 100,000 euro for building a bike, 
lane and so many people will use it, so many lives will be saved. So this right. will be, so much money we'll get, so just for Right, and of course the, you know, people dying isn't that expensive, but people living with illness is very expensive. And so you actually have to demonstrate to communities um, that they'll save money by investing. And it's interesting, you know, even some of the more conservative communities in the U.S., for example, um, dealing with something we're so bad at, which is housing our homeless, they found out that if you just give houses to homeless people, you save 70% more money than if you don't because of all the costs that accrue to you as a city when people don't have houses. So those sort of economic discussions um, are turning the tide in even some of our more conservative communities because you're calculating the, the dollar amounts. So, same idea. Okay. <clears throat> yes. By the way, I came walking here. So, <laughs> but uh, I was thinking to ask you how much attention you pay to microclimate in urban areas when designing better solutions for walking. I talk about it more in hot places than in cool places because you can always wear a coat. But it's the same thing with bicycling. Like if there's any real issue with biking, it's more in the hot cities that it's a problem. Because there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear, right? Bad clothing. Um, so, uh, but mostly I talk about microclimate in terms of shade and in terms of trees. Uh, because, the, and tall buildings, you know, Jan Gale, you guys all know Jan Gale, right? Jan Gale's the famous, what is he, Danish? I mean, he, he doesn't think you should build anything over five stories tall because once you get up around 100 feet, the wind hits the building, comes down to the street and creates these real problems. He says that, that any apartment above five stories should not be the province of the local planning department but of the air traffic control. <laughs> um, but the, um, uh, you know, most of the places I work, there's a lack, of, the problem is not, a la is not too much shadow, but a lack of spatial definition in places where a little shadow wouldn't hurt anyone. But most of the attention I pay to microclimate is simply in arguing as ardently as I can for, for more trees. Because what could be better? There's leaves in the summer to block the sun. There's no leaves in the winter, so you get the sun. They do everything. <laughs> they absorb water, as I said. 